Don't worry, I'm not preaching. Um, I was asked to do a brief scripture reading before we get started. So if you can turn with me to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Then Saul, still, uh, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to uh, Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and, and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to, to kick it against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no more, or but, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he, he uh, saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Well, thank Nathan for reading that. Uh, I'm fighting migraines. I have been fighting migraines all week, and I just. Honestly, can't read right now. I was trying to follow in Bible class, and I, I couldn't follow it all. So rather than butcher that text, I thought I'd get Nathan to read it for us. Uh, that sets the text for our conversation this morning. It's good to see everyone here. Uh, hopefully, you're doing as well or better than I am this morning, and uh, hopefully, we can we can make it through uh, what I think is an important conversation for us to have about conversion about what happens to Saul of Tarsus on that road to Damascus and some things that I think we can definitely learn from this encounter, this event in the book of Acts. This is an interesting passage to me because it's one that I think we come to it and we make a single point, and there's just a lot more here. And the single point I think we typically make in Acts chapter 9 has to do with baptism, has to do with the process of Salvation, the necessity of baptism. It's a great passage to go and argue against faith only salvation. The point being very obvious, if faith alone saves, then why was there anything that Saul had to go and do? As the text tells us that Jesus informed him of. What was the point of his baptism? Uh, we could ask a lot of questions along those lines, but I think there's something maybe more important and consequential to us at least as we think about the broader concept of conversion, which is something I think we ought to consider as often or more often than we do baptism. Baptism being one phase, one part, one step in the conversion process. We need to understand why it is we're being baptized in the, in the grand scheme of things. You know, I, I was thinking this week, if we were to talk to someone about conversion, what might be some questions that, that they should ask? And maybe the easiest one is, why should I be converted? You know, why is it that it's necessary for me to make a change? What are, what, what's so pressing? Why should I do that? And I, I think these are fair questions, by the way. I think they're questions we, we should ask about our life in Christ. You know, the second question I came up with is, what are the implications of conversion? You know, we kind of throw that word out sometimes. You know, we'll talk about conversion accounts in the book of Acts. We'll, we'll talk about the need to be converted. We'll ask maybe, we may even use that language sometimes, as so and so converted. We kind of throw that word out sometimes. I think maybe as a little bit of a, a catch all word, but you know, it's a word with deep consequences. For me individually, for you personally, what are the consequences of conversion? What does this change mean? You know, any change we make in our life, there's a consequence, isn't there? There's a benefit, isn't there? You know, there's there's always a trade-off. What when we're talking about conversion, what's it going to cost me? What am I going to gain from it? 
And I know we don't like to use that terminology when we talk about salvation, but I think there's a real sense in which the process that leads to our salvation cost us something. And then we have a lot, obviously, to gain. Maybe for those of us that are Christians, maybe we're kind of looking back on that moment of our baptism and maybe we're kind of looking at the intervening time between entering into that water and where we stand right now. And maybe we look back on that and think, I'm not sure how much I changed. And of course, that sparks a question, doesn't it? How deep should this conversion process go? How much about who I was before baptism, before I, you know, as we might talk about it, met Jesus, how much of that needs to be different after I meet Jesus? What exactly did I need to let go of? How much of me needed to be changed? Again, I think these are all fair, I would even say necessary questions. If we're going to accept the commitment that putting Christ on truly is. You know, if baptism is more than a sacrament, if baptism is more than just something I do because I was told to do it, and I think baptism is absolutely more than that, then why was I baptized? What process was I participating in? Have I thought through those things? And have they had an impact in my life? And and I think this this account with Saul is a powerful place to go and to kind of have this conversation. Because man, if ever there was a place where there was a conversion in the Bible. I mean, you know, we can go read about the the, the Philippian jailer and we can go read about the Ethiopian eunuch and we can go read about Cornelius and and we can read a lot lot of people in, in the book of Acts who were baptized. And there's a conversion there. Don't misunderstand me. But I don't know that there's a conversion more obvious than what takes place in Acts chapter 9. I mean, here's a man. He's on his way to ravage and destroy the church. He has papers from the priests in Jerusalem to take to the synagogues in Damascus, giving him permission to enter into the homes of Jewish people and interrogate them about their affiliation with Jesus and with what he calls the way and if he finds them to be part of that, to do what he did in Jerusalem, to drag them out of their homes and to put them into prison. And yet when he gets to Damascus, it's at the orders of the same Jesus he went to persecute. He's submitting to the very man, the very person, whom he thought it was blasphemy to call Lord. And he becomes one of the very people he went to persecute. That's about as big a transformation as one can possibly imagine. And and I don't know that we read of one, at least listed out the way it is in Acts chapter 9, that's anywhere so great as what we see with the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, becoming the one who is the Apostle Paul. You know, it wasn't just this, this change about how he viewed Jesus. It wasn't just this academic intellectual shift in how he saw this one individual. Is he God or is he a fool? Is he God or is he a liar? Is he God or is he a blasphemer? That's a pretty big change. But there's more than that, isn't there? And it's played out in real time in Acts chapter 9. It's discussed in Philippians chapter 3. You ever thought about how wealthy Saul of Tarsus must have been when he was going to Damascus? Somebody says, well, the Bible never says Saul of Tarsus was wealthy. Go read the Gospels. Read me about all the poor Pharisees. You could not be a leader in the Pharisees and not be a wealthy man. The wealth came along with the accomplishment. And without the accomplishment and without the wealth, you don't get permission to go and do things that Paul's going or Saul's going to do. You're not able to, to lead the way that Saul was leading within that sect of people. You understand how much of that he gave up the moment he stood up in Acts chapter 9 and preached Jesus for the first time? See, when, when Paul in Philippians chapter 3 he talks about all those accomplishments that he had as a Pharisee, and he says, I counted them but loss. New American Standard says, he counted them as rubbish. That's a very cleaned up version of what the King James says. But I think the King James gets it right. I counted it but dumb. Understand, it's not just the pedigree. 
It's not just the accolades that Paul turns his back on. But it's the wealth as well. It's the prestige. It's the position. It's the power. He looks at all of that that I think every person in all of human history has looked at and said, these are markers of success. He says, yeah, no. Those things are going to get in my way as I try to serve Jesus. And so I turned away from them. Conversion. So it's more than a mental change about how you view Jesus. It's more than just saying, hey, yesterday I wasn't going to obey Jesus. Today I'm going to obey a Jesus. Extremely important, both of those things. But what you see in Acts chapter 9 is a deep fundamental change in how Paul, how Saul of Tarsus saw the world around him, how he saw himself, how he saw his place in this world, what he saw his role is everything changes. Everything changes. In a pretty short period of time in the life and in the mind of Saul of Tarsus. So I want to spend a little bit of time looking at this text. I think there's four lessons, and I could probably, we could probably come up with way more than four, but there's four that I really want to focus on in these first several verses, and we'll notice a couple of verses later on in the chapter as well. But four, four lessons that I think are essential for us to understand. And by the way, I think these are essential for us to understand in the context of conversion. Because nothing I'm going to say this morning is going to be groundbreaking. Matter of fact, when I put this next slide up, you're going to go, well, duh. I know that. I know you know that. But have you thought about what I'm about to show you in the context of conversion? In the context of becoming <clears throat> a different person? In the context of, of the transformation that the Gospel is intended to produce in your life? That's the question I want to ask as I remind you that God knows. Well, that's very informative, wasn't it? We've known that since we were in the youngest of the Bible classes, right? God knows what? God knows everything. Yes, He does. But let's be a little bit more specific. You know, what I see in Acts chapter 9 is that God knows when His people are suffering. As a matter of fact, you don't just see this in Acts chapter 9. You really see this kind of all throughout the, the first half of the book of Acts, and then it's narrowed down just a little bit to actually the suffering of Saul of Tarsus who becomes Paul, which I, I think is very ironic and an interesting twist in, in the book of Acts. So as you get to Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, persecution forms the entire background of everything that we're reading about, doesn't it? Paul is on his way, or Saul of Tarsus. I'll probably do that the whole time, and I'll quit correcting myself from here on out. But Saul of Tarsus is on his way to, to Damascus. Why? To persecute Christians. Where did he come from? Jerusalem. What was he doing there? Persecuting Christians. Suffering forms the suffering of Christians, forms the backdrop for this entire encounter. And as a matter of fact, if you go back just a little bit, kind of put a marker there in Acts chapter 9, and flip back to Acts chapter 7, and, and, and there's Stephen, isn't he? And what's Stephen doing in Acts chapter 7? Preaching. Now, that's a blistering sermon that, that Stephen's preaching, but that's what he's doing. He's preaching. And, and what's the consequence? Verse 54, now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing at him with their teeth. Now, I used to think that was literal, like they, they were running at him trying to bite him. I'm not so sure that's what that's saying. I think the idea is that they're just, you know, they're so mad they're grinding their teeth. They're just, oh. And he knows what's coming next, doesn't he? He knows, he knows what's going to happen as a result of that or, or as that continues on. But, you know, in the very next verse, we find out he's full of the Holy Spirit and he gazed intently into heaven. And what does he see when he gazes intently into heaven? But the glory of God, and who's standing next to him? None other than Jesus himself. He sees that, and the next thing that happens is they stone him to death. And the whole time, it's as if he's focusing on the throne, and he's focusing on the Son, and he's speaking to God, and the people around him are just doing what they're going to do. But here's what I want you to see he didn't die alone. He didn't die alone. He didn't suffer alone. The God of heaven was fully aware of what was taking place. He was fully aware of the suffering that Stephen was enduring. And he didn't ignore him. Hold that thought. 
Because there's something else I think it's important for us to understand. And that is that God knows when His children are straight. He knows when His creation, and by His children, I, I really mean more broadly than, than the church or Christians or the faithful, because we're all His children, right? We're all the product of His creative effort. All men are made in His image, not just the ones that, that are trying to live righteously. We're all made in the image of, we're all the children of God. And He's fully aware when His children are straying. I really think that's why you see the suffering that you see in Acts chapter 7 and 8. But I'll tell you one thing. We end Acts chapter 7 with Stephen's murder, and what do we begin with in Acts chapter 8? A series of conversion accounts. And by the way, all of these conversion accounts after Acts chapter 8 for the next few chapters take place outside of Jerusalem. And somebody says, well, why does that matter? Go back to Acts chapter 1. How did Jesus tell? What did Jesus tell the, the apostles was going to happen after His ascension? The Holy Spirit was going to empower them to go and preach this Gospel message first in Jerusalem, then in Samaria, and then to the world. And where do we find ourselves in Acts chapter 8? Moving out of Jerusalem, we've gone to Samaria. The Gospel's on the march. The Gospel's on the march. We go from Samaria, we're on our way to Damascus over here. We get the Ethiopian in between as he's on his way to, to Africa where he's going to take the Gospel with him. Of course, we're going to move on. We're going to get into Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus is converted. Boy, that changes everything, doesn't it? Probably the most prolific preacher ever since Jesus Christ is put into motion in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 10, the Ethiopian eunuch. Now we have the Gentile. And it gets real exciting about Acts chapter 10, doesn't it? Why? I have no idea. Are, are there any Jewish people here this morning? Any Samaritans here this morning? See, Acts chapter 10 is when you and me start getting in. That's when all of a sudden this Gospel idea, this grace of God idea, this salvation, forgiveness of your sins is broadened from this Jewish concept, this sect of the Jews. And it becomes something that you and I, who had no part in that, you and I can participate in and participate in just as fully as the Jewish people do. Where did all that start? Where did all that start? It's not just that God knows. It's not just that He's aware that we're suffering. And I think this is so important, and I want you to hear me when I say this. God is not inactive, and I know that's a double negative, but I think it expresses what I've tried to say better than any way, other way I could have said it. God is not inactive in the face of the suffering of His people. Somebody says, Stephen is standing there, they're gnashing at his teeth, they're picking up stones. Saul is taking up the coats so they can go and do what they're going to do. They're going to kill this man. And that can't be a pleasant way to die, by the way. They're going to kill this man. And what do you see? God is sitting on the throne. And thank Jehovah He's there. What is He demonstrating by sitting on that throne while Stephen dies? Not that He didn't care. Not that He was impassive. Not that, not that it didn't matter to Him. That's not the point. The point is He's sovereign. And Stephen, you're going to suffer a little bit, but it's going to further the purpose of God. It's going to allow something to happen. It's going to, it's going to spark something. And because of what this man endures, lives are going to be saved. Your life can be saved. Well, wait a minute, I can still suffer as a Christian, not the life I'm talking about. No, what we're talking about is our spiritual life. And we read Acts 7, 54-58, we might wonder, why didn't He do something? He did. He sacrificed. God Himself sacrificed right there. Have you ever noticed that? The similarities between what happens to Stephen and what happens to Christ. Not that Stephen's a perfect sacrifice. That's not the point. Not that it was a sacrifice necessary so sins could be forgiven. In principle, that's not the point. 
But the, the death of Stephen, the sacrifice of Stephen that moment on that day spawns this progression of the Gospel as it goes out into the world. Could it have been done other ways? Undoubtedly it could have. But there was the moment, there was the time. God took advantage of it. Stephen goes to heaven. I don't believe what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says. That day he's with the Lord. And we can focus on the physical suffering that He endured on the way if we want to, but if that's where we're focusing, then this whole conversion question is very real for us. Because if that's where I'm focusing, I really haven't changed much. Maybe I've quit doing a few things, but in my core, in my heart, I haven't really changed much. No, Stephen went exactly where Stephen wanted to go. Stephen received exactly what he wanted to receive. I'm sure he would have taken a different path to get there if he could have chosen it. But he goes to be with the Lord. And because of the sacrifice he made on the way, the Gospels in Samaria, the Gospels in Ethiopia, Saul of Tarsus is converted on the way to Damascus, the Ethiopian eunuch is converted. Keep going, right? Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 13 go out and they start taking the Gospel to the whole world, the Gentile world. And it never stops from there, does it? There's a ball that is set into motion there in Acts chapter 7 that's still rolling today. There's an opportunity for life that is set into motion with the presentation of the Gospel and the spreading of that Gospel in Acts chapter 7. And it is still in motion today. Don't tell me God doesn't care. He's been giving life for all of that time. For all of that time. So God knows and God cares. God cares. Look at that in Acts chapter 9. It's an interesting thing that Jesus says in Acts chapter 9, verse 4. There at the end, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul of Tarsus had never met Jesus. Somebody says, how do you know that? Who are you, Lord? There's not a disembodied voice. And you've got to get this picture. Saul's not hearing a disembodied voice. Saul is seeing the resurrected Christ. Jesus of Nazareth is standing before him. And he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul looks at him and he says, who are you? He was not at the foot of the cross. He, he was not one of those who drove the nails into His hands. He was not one who, who held a, a scourge and, and beat our Savior. And yet Jesus says to him, why are you persecuting Me? It's a beautiful thing if you'll stop and think about it. God cares. See, Paul was persecuting the church. Saul was persecuting the church, wasn't he? It's a, it's a very interesting and maybe a little bit unique use of the, the figure that we see in a lot of other places in the New Testament used to describe the church. The figure of a body. And typically we use that figure and we're talking about headship, right? So, so Christ is the head, the church is the body. And so Christ has authority over the church, and so the church must go where the head directs, right? We also use it as a figure for fellowship, right? Paul does in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in and, and several other places. And the idea being that we're all part of the same body. Which means, means no one's more important than anyone else. And then unless we all work together, we don't do a whole lot, do we? We don't function. We don't function properly. But Jesus uses it a little bit differently here, even though He doesn't necessarily say, my body. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, Saul's not persecuting Jesus. He's persecuting Christians. Wait a minute. When you persecute Christians, you persecute Jesus. Right? You ever catch that pinky toe in the dresser in the middle of the night and dance around and say, only my toe hurts? <laughs> nope. Maybe I'm a big baby, man. I'm down on the ground. The whole body's rolling around whining. Right? When you persecute the saints, you persecute the Lord. Jesus cares. God cares. And the point I was making a moment ago, 
all of the suffering that we read about in Acts 1 through 9, and really all the suffering we read about that the church has endured throughout history, it is in service of saving souls. We've got to keep that in mind. We've got to understand that the very things that the early church endured demonstrates God's care, God's care for His creation. And again, not just for those of us who've named the name of Christ. Right? I mean, I think that'd be easy for us to do. Well, I've already been baptized. Can we cut that suffering stuff out? I'm ready to go home. Let's, let's just, let's God, we, let's turn that faucet off. No. See, God wants all men to repent. And He wants the body of Christ to want all men to repent. And God is willing to sacrifice so that all men have the opportunity for salvation. And God wants His people to be willing to sacrifice so that all men have access to salvation. See, God's care is broader than just me. Can't get very far with a selfish view of grace. Because God's grace is meant for everyone. And I think, you know, in a, in a, maybe in a strange way in our minds, that's revealed to us in, in Acts chapter 9. So Jesus saw the persecution of the saints as his persecution. All the suffering we're reading about in the New Testament in service of saving souls. Let me ask you something. Where's your focus? Where, where is it that you're, you're looking toward? God cares. Do we? You, know, you don't have to be a Christian very long before you hear someone make the argument that God does not care. Right? Very few people just come right out and say, well, I don't think God cares. It's usually phrased in the question of why does God dot dot dot, right? Why would God allow you fill in the blank with something terrible? And I don't mean in any way to belittle the something terrible. A lot of terrible things happen. I think it's terrible a man gets stoned to death for simply standing up and telling the truth. So we're told, well, God doesn't care because He allows... I mean, it's the main it's the main argument of the atheist, right? Now, why is it that an atheistic scientist I, I can give you a book where scientists from every field talk about, many of them talk about how in their education process they'll be told, especially in biology and cosmology, they'll be told, as you're doing this study, as you're studying, it's gonna look like there's design and a pattern. Ignore it. Now, now, why would people who have given their lives over to observation and drawing conclusions from observation say, hey, but this big thing you're going to observe, let's just ignore that. Why? Why would they, why would they want to do that? Well, I think it's the argument you hear from a lot of atheists, right? If there's an all-powerful, all-benevolent good, how does He allow evil to exist? That sounds really magnanimous when you put it that way, right? I'm concerned about everybody. But the way you hear that expressed in personal conversation is a little bit different, isn't it? If there's an all-powerful, all-good God, why did He let something bad in my life happen? Could I suggest to you that that is a misunderstanding of how to view life? And God? And the world? And my place in it? Paul gives us the proper view. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, he talks about the momentary light affliction. You go back and read the rest of chapter 4. I guarantee if you were going through, go read chapter 1, by the way. And I guarantee if any of us were going through what Paul was going through then, we would not call it light affliction. Paul's not belittling the suffering. I want to point that out. Over and over in 2 Corinthians, he talks about the suffering in intense terms. He's not belittling the suffering. It's a point of comparison that he's making. 
what he's saying is, as bad as it is, chapter 1, we, we suffered to the point that I believe he dies and is resurrected. You don't want to believe that? That's fine. He suffers nearly to the point of death then in chapter 1. That's pretty big stuff. What he's saying though is in comparison to what he can receive from Christ, in comparison to the glory that is to be his, that was as if nothing. It's like a man with $10 million and then you compare him to Jeff Bezos. Right? They're both rich, but all of a sudden there's a totally different category of rich, right? When we're talking about somebody with about $200 billion to their name. So the guy with $10 million doesn't look very rich compared to Jeff Bezos. I have $4 in my wallet this morning. I don't know about you. $10 million sounds like a whole bunch. It's comparative. Paul says, I'm willing to endure this, not because it's nothing, not because it's not really suffering, but because of where my focus is. If you think God doesn't care because you're enduring some physical suffering, let me ask you, where is your focus? And why isn't it the same as Paul? If you've named the name of Jesus Christ and you claim to have faith in Him and you claim that heaven is the place that you want to go, then why would whatever physical malady you're enduring today, as intense and severe and real as I'm, I, I'm no doubt it is, again, don't want to belittle that at all. What God's concerned about is your eternal salvation. What God is concerned about is heaven as your home. Why aren't you? I'll go through this one kind of quickly. Mostly because I didn't mean to spend so much time on that last one. God's people stand out. And again, this is kind of inferred from, from verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9. He goes and he, he gets permission to go to Damascus and to find the men and the women that are of the way. You, you realize there was no building with a sign out that said men and, wielding, men and women of the way, right? They, they, didn't have, they, they didn't have something out on the road that said, we'll be here at 9.30 in the morning. They're probably mingling in the synagogue. They're probably going to each other's houses after work, probably pretty late at night. And gathering in each other's houses and having these relatively private assemblies. It's probably happening once a week in a place like Damascus. And yes, Saul was confident that when he got there, he could find people. He was confident. I mean, you don't go ask permission. You don't go get letters of authority from the high priest to go somewhere and do something if you don't think you can get it done. Right? You, you don't want to go and fail. Saul was confident he could go and find them. How? Well, somehow they were different. Something about them was going to stand out. And Saul was aware of that. And Saul understood that. And Saul counted on that difference so that he would be able to go and to find those who, who were of the way. How was he going to know them? Well, there was going to be some different practices, wasn't there? Let's go find some houses with a lot of people and knock on the door and see if they're taking the Lord's Supper. Let's see, let's see what their worship service was, like. it was going to look different. Maybe their character was going to be a little different. I mean, as we read through the New Testament, it seems like there's a very closed-minded view of the world that the Jewish people are holding, not just, not just the Gentiles, their own people, if they weren't exactly, they didn't look exactly like they thought they should. So if you were poor, if you were lame, if you were sick from birth, if you were widowed, if you were orphaned. And yet when I open up my New Testament, you, you start reading through Acts, who do we find is encouraged to be part of the Lord's church? The very people, the Jewish people said, yeah, they're the outskirts, we're not even sure God's grace reaches that far. And yet, the Gospel's going right to them. Maybe they were going to be different in practice. Maybe they were going to be different in association. I don't know, but there was going to be a difference. 
Paul knew he was going to be able to see that difference. And that brings us back to that really important question, how much must I change? When we talk about conversion, what are we talking about? We're talking about transformation. Right? What are we talking about? What, you know, metamorphosis. The caterpillar, that kind of ugly, wormy looking thing becomes the butterfly, right? That beautiful thing that flows through the air with, with you know, the picture of symmetry and everything that's beautiful. Well, how much do I have to change? Let me ask you that question. What do you need to change? I want you to hear that question real quick. What do you need to change? If you got a little bit uncomfortable when I asked that question and something popped in your mind, I want to be careful here because I know some people have these really, really tender consciences and you're just looking for things that need to change. I'm not talking to you right now. You're probably making the change. I'm talking to the rest of us. We stepped on our cricket a long time ago. Some of you may not get that because you're too young. Ask your parents later. We stepped on our cricket a long time ago. It's a little harder to get to us sometimes. But when when somebody just asks you straight out like that, what what needs to be changing in your life? Something pops in your head. What is it? I promise you that needs to change. That's probably the reason you're asking the question, right? When we say what needs to change, what we mean is do I have to let go of that thing? Go see the rich young ruler and ask him. What needs to change? Whatever would keep me from Christ. Whatever would slow me down in His service. Whatever would lead to selfishness. Whatever would would, would convince me that, that sharing the Gospel with the lost is really not that important. Whatever's in my life that I would say this is more important than than participating in what the local church is doing and being with Christians and worshiping God with them. Whatever those things are, they need to go. And I don't care if you're not a Christian, you just became a Christian, or you've been a Christian for decades. Whatever those things are, they need to go. Last but not least, we're going to talk a little bit about baptism. Over in Acts chapter 9. I want you to notice that Paul completely submitted himself. He completely submitted himself. Why? Because submission is the only way. And I, we got to be careful here. We've got to be really careful here. And I'm going to say we've got to be careful here because we live in the United States of America. And we've been told that because we live in the United States of America, we don't have to submit to anybody. Now, that's not how they taught us in grammar school. And that's not what the Constitution says. And you're not going to find that as a historical precedence in the U.S. But somehow that's where we've gotten And I think there is a temptation. I've never been outside the U.S. I don't know what it's like anywhere else. But I think there is a temptation in this country to be Americans that go to church rather than Christians that happen to live in America. And if that's the case, this whole submission thing is going to taste terrible. And we're gonna we're gonna just we're just gonna hate it. And yet it is the core central foundational principle that even allows for me to be converted. You get that with Saul, right? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, O Lord? Jesus. Look at verse 5. He said, Who are you, Lord? And He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city. Listen to this. And it will be told you what you must 
dude. I think a lot of good Americans go, whoop, you had me right up to you, you told me I had to do something. I, I, I have liberty. Might want to look that word up. Might want to find out what that actually means. It's not what Paul said. Paul got up and went. Blind as a bat, can't find his way. The three men who hear the voice but don't see the Lord have to lead him into the city. He sits there and he sits there waiting for who? One of the people he came to persecute. To do what? To tell him what he must do. Who told him he must do it? The very Jesus that he saw as blasphemy. Absolute and complete surrender of His will. Absolute and complete submission is what we see taking place in this conversion process. If I had to pick one concept and say, here's what, here's what conversion is, I think this is the concept I would talk about. It is submission. It is taking a life that is living in rebellion, that is looking at God and kind of thumbing its nose and saying, I don't have to do what you tell me. And then all of a sudden that life is changed. That life is changed to become a person, a life that says, God, not, not my will, but thine be done. That's what conversion is. If we were going to just kind of boil it down into, into the most simplest of concepts, and there's a process that goes along with that. I'm not denying any of that. But as far as what changes in me, that's the number one thing I've got to change. Right? Sin is lawlessness. What is lawlessness? It is rebellion. It is pride manifested. Saul says, Lord, what must I do? And he goes and he does it. He doesn't say, I don't have to do that. I'm, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. Well, I'm, I'm acting on the authority of the high priest. No, see, he understands that Jesus has more authority than the high priest. And I, I think sometimes in our country, in, in, in this nation, in the church, in this nation, we need to get that straight too. The Bible is more powerful and authoritative than the Constitution. And whatever freedoms we think the Constitution gives us. And don't misunderstand me, I greatly appreciate the Constitution and its powers and its limiting of government. I, I think it's a wonderful thing. But I can't view God like I view the government. The government is a created entity. The government is made up of other men. The government is fallible. And flawed and corrupt. I don't care what government we're talking about. That's all of them, right? The God of heaven is perfect and holy and just and infallible and incorruptible. And I have to submit to Him. Paul did that in baptism. Chapter 9, verse 18. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. Ananias has come and told him what he needs to do. Something fell from his eyes scales and he regained his sight and he got up. It says he got up and was baptized. He got up and was baptized. Acts 22 and verse 16 kind of gives us the other perspective of that. Ananias comes and tells him, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sin. Really interesting. I'm going to talk about grammar for just a moment. And I said it's really interesting. That's, that's ironic. I'm glad Clinton got that anyway. You know, Acts chapter 9, verse 18. Was baptized. Passive voice. The action of the verb is being done to the subject. And I find that very powerful. Because I don't know of anything more passive that we do in the process of conversion than baptism, right? I'll never forget when I baptized my niece. We were in South Arkansas and we actually had some pretty cold weather. And we didn't have a heater in our baptistry. And, and I don't know if it had been that cold in Bradley, Arkansas in 20 years. And she comes forward. And she's a little bitty girl. little bitty girl. Real thin. <laughs> and I get in there and I've got my waders on. And I get in and as I'm walking in, it's cold through my waders. And I'm like, uh-oh. And uh, she got up on the stairs and I went over there and I said, hey, let me tell you, stay right there. I'm going to take your confession while you're up there and then I'm just going to grab you and I'm going to put you in the water and I'm going to pull you back up because it's cold. I'm going to do this as fast as I can. And I, I always think of that when I'm thinking about somebody says baptism's a work. 
I literally took that little girl by the arms, yanked her, put her down, and put her back. She did nothing but scream. That was all she did. Could not have been more passive. And yet I promise you, I promise you people would have said, there she goes trying to earn her salvation. How? She was baptized. But then in 22 and verse 16, it's a little bit different. 22 and verse 16 is in the middle voice. In Greek, the the middle voice is the voice that signifies that the subject of the verb is being affected by its own action or is acting upon itself. So he did do something. Right? Get up and get baptized. That's what it says. And that's kind of an interesting thing to think about too. Maybe you're here right now and maybe you're thinking, today's the day. I'm not going to come drag you up. Nobody's going to make that decision for you. You're going to have to decide. You're going to have to let us know. If you want me to carry you from there, I'll do that. But you're at least going to have to make the decision, right? Which I kind of find interesting when you put those two verses together. I think you start to understand what baptism is. It's submission through action. And I know when we're talking about baptism, our denominational friends go, you can't submit through action, but they will with repentance and they will with confession and they will with the works that they show after their baptism. It's just baptism that everybody has a problem with. And yet that's exactly how Acts describes baptism. It's submission through action. Paul submitted himself by obeying God and entering into the waters of baptism. But that's not all he did. He then, and and boy, what a beautiful picture, right? We go over to Romans 6 and talk about this all the time. Rise to walk in newness of life, right? So I'm baptized into the death of Christ. I'm buried as Christ was buried in baptism. And then I'm risen out. I have to, I come back out of that water to what end? Never to die again, right? Spiritual death. I rise to walk in newness of life. A new in a different life. That's exactly what Paul does. In both nine, chapter 9 and in chapter 22, That's what Ananias goes to tell him. It's not just to be baptized. That's not all that Ananias goes to tell him. No, Acts 22 and verse 10, I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go into Damascus. And there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. Ananias is told that he's been appointed, Saul has been appointed to take the Gospel to kings and to the Gentiles and to Israel. God chose him for his ability to go and speak. To persuade and convince. And he'd walk away from that life of the Pharisee. You want to talk about submission? He'd walk away from the life of the Pharisee and eventually die because he preached the gospel. What is conversion? It's exactly what you see in Acts 9. And you know, I'm afraid sometimes that we emphasize baptism so much and we absolutely need to emphasize the importance of baptism. Nathan just taught, I think it was two classes on baptism. Really good classes. And we need need to consider those things and understand the importance of those things. But I don't know very many people that sit in churches of Christ that don't know about baptism. But we need to talk about conversion too. A change. There's a change of state that takes place in baptism from unforgiven to forgiven. I understand that. But that's sure not all I see in Acts chapter 9. There's a wholesale change in the life of Saul. And it needs to be in my life. And it needs to be in your life. If we're going to be the children of God. If you're here this morning, you're subject to the invitation of the gospel. We want to help you in any way that we can. Why don't you let us know right now while we stand and while we sing.